Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA Network Plus Certification Training Course, the online training course that knows exactly what happened in Vegas. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about evaluating the network. We're going to go through some scenarios where we're looking at our network documentation. And this comes to us from our N10004 exam, section 4.3. We're going to go back through physical diagrams, logical network diagrams. We're going to look at our wiring schematics and a lot of other things that we were talking about in our last module. And I'm going to show you some what if scenarios where we'll be able to apply some of these things we've learned with our documentation to answer questions. So let's get started on one of these. Let's talk about planning out a wide area network. And if you remember from our last module, this was our wide area network, our logical design of our WAN that we had configured. So the question is, where are our single points of failure? This is all based in Florida for this wide area network. So obviously, things like hurricanes might be of a concern to us. So we need to think about if a problem ever occurred, where would it occur to create a problem for us? Where would be the single points of failure? And you can see from this logical network diagram, almost this entire network has points of failure. There's points of failure between our main buildings and our branches. There's points of failure directly into our MPLS cloud. Now, the MPLS cloud is something that's usually managed by a third party provider. And inside the cloud, there is usually redundancy involved there. There's usually multiple switches and multiple paths. But you also have to check with the manufacturer or check with your, your wide area network provider just to make sure that they have that level of redundancy inside of their cloud. Not always the case. Well, if we know where our single points of failure on, how could we make this network more redundant? If the MPLS network went away, it was washed away by a hurricane, what could we do? Well, there's a couple of different options here. We have some environments where we have separate links to the internet. This is very common. In a main facility, they'll put a separate link to the internet, and everybody will have a separate link to the internet through a completely separate network, often a different provider. And they will use their technologies on both sides of the links to put up an encrypted tunnel between those sites so that the traffic is even, although it's going over our public internet, all the traffic is private. Nobody else can really see what's going on inside of there. So that's one way to go about doing that. You could also just tack up separate lines between each one of these buildings, separate connections. And then you have to ask the question, should we do this to the branches? Or should we do it directly to the office buildings? So all of these questions come into mind, and it's all coming from this one logical diagram. But you can see now we can use that diagram in a building, in an office. We can sit in a conference room and talk about what's our next steps to make this network more redundant. Let's talk about using our baselines that we've created. So here's a question. Somebody's come to you and said, we need to load this automated process that runs on the server. It's a completely batch process. It's hands off. Nobody really touches this process, but it needs to run every night. It rolls up some files. It re-indexes some databases. Who knows what it does? But they do tell us it uses quite a bit of CPU. So if you're going to put this on a server, we can, we can run it at any time of the day, but we need to make sure that whatever server we put this on does not impact the end user's environment and what they're doing. So we need to understand where are we going to put this and what time of day should we have this fire off. So one of the things we would like to do is look at a baseline. Here's a very simple baseline just for an entire day. So this is a good idea to look at maybe a day, maybe look over a week, maybe look even over a month to get a feel for this. This is a great place to start. This is CPU usage for a single server during the day. And I can see from a 24-hour time frame, I can see some peaks kind of up in different places. But notice, generally, 12 AM to 6 AM, we got pretty much low usage compared to everywhere else. It tends to stay under or just about 25%, whereas other parts of the day are going up as high as 50% and, and really peaking up just a little above that. So if I had to pick a time that I would want to put that service on, uh, pick somewhere at 3 o'clock in the morning. As long as that doesn't run for very long, we should be just fine. There's probably fewer people connecting to the service during that time frame, and you're not going to have any impact on your end users. Let's do a what if analysis using our physical network documentation. So we have a map of the network. We know exactly what's connected to where. We know exactly what IP addresses are used between those. And someone's come to us and said, we've got a new file server we want to put in your network. Uh, everybody needs to access this server. It has centralized information on it. So everybody kind of needs the same abilities, the same access, the same bandwidth, the same rights to be able to get to that server. Where should we put that server in this environment? 
Now, we already have a couple of clues here. But if we look at a breakdown before we get too deep into it, we know we have two separate buildings. There's a building two here and a building one. Both buildings connect to a core router. That core router then connects to the internet firewall and out to the internet. Now, also connected to the core router is a core switch. And notice we have some consolidated services there already. We have an email server and a database server consolidated. So if we were going to pick a really good place to have another consolidated server, right here, connect it directly to that core switch, give it an address on that 10 dot network, that 192.168.10.8 will be our new server, and everybody will have exactly the same access to it. Let's take the same network now and put another question to it. Let's say that the marketing department is in building two, and they bought a brand new printer that's going to be used for proofs, color proofs that are going to be sent off to magazines and to other places where they're going to do advertising. So nobody else is going to use this printer but the marketing department. Nobody else in any other building or any other department. So if you were going to connect this printer, where would you connect it? Well, the big clue for us is that the marketing department is in building two. So if I had to pick a switch, a router, or a device to plug it to, I would probably plug it into this switch in building two where all of my users are. That would give the marketing department local access to the printer. We wouldn't be cluttering up the core of our network, although we could put it in the core if we had switches. Why would we use a very critical core switch port for that printer, especially since the core is probably in a different building and away from the marketing department? That doesn't make any sense. And we wouldn't put it in building one. The marketing department isn't in building one. So if we connect to this building two switch, this will be a perfect place to connect in and marketing will have direct access to their new advanced printer. Well, it's not just about our physical network layout, our logical network layout, and where we're putting printers. We also need to think about what documentation would we use if there was a crisis. So let's say a water pipe has burst in the computer room. And before you go too far with this, this is actually something that really did happen to me. So you're in the computer room. You come in in the morning, and water is dripping from the ceiling. What do you do? Well, if you're like me, when in trouble or in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. It doesn't actually solve anything, but you may feel a little better. So once you're done with that, you may want to think about how you're going to resolve this issue. You should have already in place a documented set of policies and procedures. And so a lot of things suddenly come into play right here. Refer back to that. Who do you call? Well, what type of problem is it? It's a problem that affects the facilities. It's a problem that affects the, the company being able to work that day. So management of the company needs to be involved. The people who are in charge of the servers and the other equipment in that room, the security team, the network team, this is kind of an all hands on deck type issue. So we have all of their numbers, fortunately, already documented. And already, we're being sure that we're informing the right people based on this particular problem. There's probably also going to be procedures if anything happens that's going to affect your customers. So what procedures are those? We already have a set of outage notices and policies and procedures based on that. So let's go ahead and perform those procedures as well. And there may also be disaster recovery procedures in play. If you know that you've got a separate facility, a separate part of the building that you can go to, you'll want to do that as well. In my environment, it wasn't a water pipe that burst. There was actually on a previous floor a coffee machine that's connected to the water line, and that particular link broke and dripped down through the floor through the holes in the floor that were cut to allow network cables and all the way into the computer room. And in our case, it wasn't that bad of a leak. We simply put plastic everywhere, stopped the water flow, mopped it up, and we were OK. But we did call everybody. We went through our customer impacting procedures. And we, of course, tried to make a determination, do we shut down this facility and do we move it somewhere else? Very common and very easy to follow as long as you have those policies and procedures in place. So in review, we've looked at how we would use our network documentation. We've looked at using our logical network diagrams, our physical network diagrams, cases where our policies and procedures would come in play. And we've stepped through different scenarios and asked questions about where devices would go and what we would do in different situations. If you'd like to watch many more Network Plus videos, participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com. <laughs>